Hope everybody's doing good. If it looks like I just woke up, it's because I did. <laughs> I was thinking all night last night about this young fighter, this young man who was in his only his sixth professional fight on a UFC stage and after two rounds, he could not continue. Um, and he asked his corner to stop the fight and then he asked the ref to stop the fight. I wanna talk about this. This is a fascinating, fascinating moment. I will add, I have seen this happen more than a few times in my commentary role on uh, smaller shows, on regional shows. So I've seen it, I've been sitting there and I've been able to analyze it. There's a couple of things I wanna chat about with this kind of fascinating moment uh, and fascinating moments like this. And that is what happened and why it happened. And I wanna look at the fighter, I wanna look at the coach, and I wanna look at we, the audience, okay? So first of all, what happened? After two rounds of fighting, this young man with only five pro fights, and, and I will add, his five pro fights coming up, he would have had a massive skill advantage. So he wasn't dealing with a lot of the pressures of fighting because he would have been able to be out front. He had five submissions, he's a submission artist, called up for his sixth fight on a much bigger stage, not, incremental jumps, not a, a chance to kind of callous his mind and, and harden and armor up his mentality. He went from, you know, easily being able to beat these guys to a very, very high pressure fight under dire and stressful circumstances. So what happened? So this is what's interesting. In a lot of cases, we're not necessarily in charge of our own brains, our own decision making. We all feel this when we snap at our mother for a moment and then we can't believe what we, we may have said. Everyone's had that experience. We freak out when a guy cuts us off in traffic and we don't act like ourselves. We can almost feel like somebody else is in charge for a moment. And that's actually what's happening. So when you're fighting, you're not just fighting another man or another woman in a contest. You are fighting yourself. And that sounds like a cliche or a metaphor, but it's actually true. So a fight takes place in various parts of the brain. Um, there's the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. What's happening in there, that's a primal part of the brain. So when we experience that fight or flight, emotion, anxiety, that's taking place in the amygdala, in the limbic system. At a high level, you're wanting to fight much more in the prefrontal cortex, right? That's a different, entirely different area of the brain. If, if we used brain imaging, you would see activity in these different areas and literally entirely different manners of thought. Now the prefrontal cortex, uh, I actually grabbed a few little details to put here. Focusing one's attention, predicting the consequences of one's action, anticipating events within the environment, impulse control, managing emotional reactions, planning for the future, uh, adjusting complex behaviors. Quote, I can't do A until I do B. That's where we want to be operating, at least in part with a natural flow of dealing with these things. But in the limbic system, in the amygdala, in that primal lizard area of the brain, we start to just react. We, we react with emotion, we react with intensity. Again, that fight or flight mechanism is there. Why is that there? So what, what happened with this young man? Um, my friend Chad Pearson, who's a coach, he, I've broken this down on YouTube already. He looked at me and he said, bang on. He's not only a coach, but he's dealt with sort of high performing military people. And he called it limbic transfer. Where, where the activity of the brain is happening moves into this area. Now what you do, and what this young man did, is he felt this overwhelming anxiety. He felt a panic, and it felt like he had to get out of there no matter what. He literally could not handle it anymore. This is not a reflection on him. This is not a reflection on his conscious thought. This is not a judgment, although many people will judge him and have judged him, and they have no right. He has, throughout his life, not quit thousands of times to get to that point. You have to not quit at Blue Belt, you have to not quit in competition, you have to not quit in training, you have to not quit in, uh, at the highest levels, you have to not quit in sparring, you have to not quit on the low levels. So you, it's in a slow, gradual raising of intensity of dealing with pressure and moving on. But in this case, you hit that panic that feels like th there is no other choice. So that's what we said, fighter, coach, and corner, and us, we, the audience. So his brain is battling with itself. You're feeling this overwhelming, you know, panic. And that's real, it, because what's happening in your brain is real for you. Now, if 
under the right circumstances, we could get you from that area of the brain through calming, through breathing exercises, through adjusting your focus and get you a little more back into that prefrontal cortex area of your brain. You could look at it and go, wait, if I retire, if I, I want out of this fight, I will lose. If I lose uh, and I will regret this tomorrow, I will regret it with everything that I have. If that happens, uh, my career, which I'm planning for the future, so you can see the consequences of it, if you can get out of that lizard area of the brain, but he was not able to do that. Now this is real. This isn't some, good, by the way, good morning, <laughs> iced coffee. This isn't some weirdo MMA analyst thing. I study martial arts, and when you study martial arts, you're required to, you, it's a game like studying anything, deeply dedicating your life to any kind of deep study. It is a game of continually asking, well, why is that happening? And then studying that, oh, this is about focus. Oh, this is about brain chemistry. Oh, and then you continually study these things and upgrade your own understanding of it. This is just the science of how the brain works under stress. Excuse me. So we'll look at this and we all may form opinions on it. That's the third one, that's audience. I'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about the corner for a moment. Now, uh, Drysdale, his coach, is a high-level competitor, MMA fighter, coach for his whole life. So whether he understands this from a scientific standpoint, a biochemistry standpoint, a neurology standpoint, like I'm explaining it, or he understands it from experience, personal experience, that feeling of panic, if we can get you past it, you will, you know, all the greatest things in life are on the other side of that kind of panic and fear. And he knows this. He also knows that an hour before, if you ask this young man who now wants out of this fight because of a panicked sort of uh, neurological response of the brain that's there for, uh, might I add, to protect us. We exist today because our ancestors uh, followed those behaviors as a result of the brain activity to run away from saber-toothed tigers so they could continue to, to have offspring, including us. And we still exist because of this lizard area of the brain, because of this primal area of the brain. Right? So this is normal. This is a normal human behavior that this man is having that he may not have if instead of going, I had nine pro MMA fights at a low level, but it was around seven or eight that I started to understand truly that there was going to be a battle in my head that I didn't, hadn't prepared for and I had to be prepared for these things. At fight, if this young man fights again, he will now know that this level of panic is possible and then he'll be able to control himself. But the coach understands that. Whether he understands it from, like I said, this neurological and biochemical standpoint, or he understands it from experience. But this is a problem. This is our audience problem. This is the problem with people analyzing fighting that don't fight. This is, a, you know, people will say, I am a combat sports analyst, or I am a fighting analyst, but they don't actually train martial arts. 90% of the understanding of the information is only available within the experience. That's why when I wanted to really understand martial arts, I had to do it nine times, I had to fail. You have to fail and know what this is and know that you then have to change things, reprogram yourself so that you can uh, succeed in the future. So this is part of that experience for him. But Drysdale and his corners know this. Again, whether they know it this way or they know it because they've been there. They know it because they felt it and they felt it and they've overcome it. They also know if you talk to this young man two hours before, three days before, a week ago, and said, what would be your greatest fear? He would say that I would quit, that I wouldn't get the best out of myself, that I would not, you know, show up under pressure. That would be his greatest fear. And if you talk to him today, and young man, if you happen to be watching this, and if anyone knows him, you can pass this to him. So he understands the, the mechanism that happened and doesn't judge himself. He is in absolute turmoil today because anyone who's had this kind of failure that happens. It's not a failure of character. It's not a failure of guts or of, of you know, uh, courage. It's a failure of being able to work within the challenges of your own human chemistry and nature. He is in turmoil today. He's devastated. His coach knew he would be if he couldn't help him pass this. His coach understood if he could shift him from the panicked area of the brain into that rational thinking, decision-making area that this young man would be willing and able to continue and he would be so grateful that he, his coach begged him to continue. If he knew this would happen, he would beg his coach to, under these circumstances, beg him to continue, trust me. And <laughs> I hope he speaks at some point, and he will once he understands that this is normal. 
This is a normal behavior. He was not, he had not been acclimatized to this level of stress under these circumstances with everything on the line. That's why we do that. That's also why we can't sit there from the couch if we are a journalist or a fan or whatever and judge because we don't understand it because most of the information is only available within the experience. And we all sit around pontificating of our opinions. We, and let that, let's make it to the third point, the audience, us. We humans form opinions easily. We feel and we'll defend them. This is my right to an opinion. But the opinion traps you and prevents you from learning. If you don't know anything about brain surgery or you know, um, high level economics or whatever, fighting, these are complex things that require a lifetime of study. When you know nothing about it, if you say, I don't know anything about it, that seems odd, but rather than have outrage or re over overreaction, if I prevented myself, if you hear a little meep, that's my dog, he can't get on the couch because he's old and he wants my help. If you, if you look at these things and go, wait a second, if I hesitate, if I, if I battle my own tendency to jump to conclusions or form an opinion, I will be capable of learning something. But if I say, that coach, that's disgusting what he did, we don't know it. We have no information. We're reacting with no knowledge, no first-hand specialized knowledge whatsoever. So we're judging people that we don't understand what's going on. That coach, it's not disgusting. That coach knows from first-hand experience that that young man would have done anything today to stay in that fight. Today, right now, as, he, as you're watching this young man or, or as wherever he is, and I know that feeling, we've all had it. Maybe not on this stage, but we've had it and it's devastating. And it takes a lot of emotional labor to work your way past it, understand your human, understand you had a human reaction, understand that limbic transfer took place from the, the area of the brain that you operate complex, stressful things, at like, a, like a cage fight, and moved it into that panicked area. He understands that. He will understand that when he does, he will understand that now it becomes a game of improving yourself, improving your mind, improving your perspective, improving your ability to manage stress. And those are real. The fight isn't an arm bar, a jab, a takedown. The fight isn't leg kicks and forward pressure and distance management. It isn't. The fight is within the human, which is one more time, I'm not trying to sh cast shade, but a lot of people talk about fighting and most of them are missing 90% of the information. This is the real shit here. This is what's happening. What the fuck do you think is happening? You've put yourself into a cage in your underpants with the spotlight effect and all of these minds, all of these things happening and you're fighting you and that's not a metaphor. And last night, that young man, if, shut up Pluto, that young man's you overcame him. So please pass this on. If you have any feedback, I welcome all of it. I really appreciate you. I got, had to get up at 7 a.m. this morning to, uh, to spew this out because I find it so deeply fascinating. And I hope you do too. Thanks for watching my stuff. Feel free to share it anytime. And uh, much love. Pluto, I'm coming to help you. Enjoy the hostilities, my friends.